As I first reported last week, Twitter's checkmark system is coming back, but not only blue checkmarks. And Elon and Twitter released a blog post on the Twitter official blog on the 12th of December that says Twitter blue is back and gold checkmarks are here. So this is the first upgrade to the checkmark system since Elon took down the $8 blue checkmark system, and now it's been reinstated. So this is what they say on the blog. Starting today, we're enabling, re-enabling Twitter blue signups on iOS and web. Twitter blue subscribers will get access to subscriber only features such as edit tweet, 1080p video uploads and reader mode. Subscribers will also receive a blue check mark after their accounts are reviewed to ensure they meet all of our requirements, including our rules against impersonation, accounts found to be breaking our rules may be suspended without a refund. So when they rolled out the first blue check mark, the verified check mark that you had to pay $8 for on Twitter after Elon Musk bought the platform, it kind of showed that the platform wasn't ready for that. The people weren't ready for that. It was, they jumped the gun. They jumped the gun on it. Like plain and simple. They jumped the gun on it. They weren't ready to take care of this. And some people took advantage of that. Some trolls used their $8 to buy a check mark and they changed their usernames to another handle that was similar to another company, you know, and then they tanked the stock a little bit. They said that Eli Lilly was the manufacturer, the drug manufacturer. They said that they were going to be giving away insulin for free. And the response was super negative on their stock profile. Elon and Twitter made up new rules for this sort of occurrence. This is from the Twitter rules page because I want to quote this so you can get the full perspective. The title is, what is a misleading or deceptive identity? And it goes on to say, one of the main elements of an identity on Twitter is an account's profile which includes a username, which is the at handle, the account name, the profile image, and the bio. An account's identity is deceptive under this policy if it uses false profile information to represent itself as a person or entity that is not associated with the account owner such that it may mislead others who use Twitter. Deceptive identities may feature the likeness of another person or organization in a manner that confuses others about the account's affiliation. Fake identities, which may use stolen or computer-generated photos and fabricated names to pose as a person or organization that doesn't exist, are also considered deceptive when they engage in disruptive or manipulative behavior. And when you sign up for Twitter Blue, there are going to be some stipulations for your account. Right? You sign up for $8 on the web or $11 per month when you sign up through iOS. Subscribers who sign up on one platform will have Twitter blue on all the platforms. So prices may vary due to your region and they plan to offer subscriptions on Android eventually as well. It's available right now in Canada, United States, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. And they're going to be rolling out to other territories in the future. Now, there's a few things that you have to think about when you think about the Twitter blue thing. In addition to reviewing all accounts at the sign up, Twitter is going to be taking a bunch of steps to detect and prevent impersonation. Subscribers who change their profile information, including their display name, their profile photo, and the username or handle will temporarily lose their blue check mark until those changes are reviewed by Twitter. And Elon kind of slashed the company in half, fired half the people, some other people walked out and they, they left the company. So they're short-staffed at this point. They have to check out all these accounts, review all the accounts. But Elon also said, hey, if you're here at Twitter, you have to step up your game. So you have to work the long hours like a startup. They have to verify your account. Elon also said accounts created within the last 90 days, inactive accounts, accounts without a verified phone number, and accounts with recent changes to the profile information will not be able to subscribe to Twitter Blue at this time. And have you ever wanted a golden check mark next to your profile? Well, you can get one. According to Twitter, they're replacing the official label with a gold check mark on some business accounts on Twitter. They'll be also adding a gray check mark for government and multilateral accounts. Now, let's get into these new check marks because they seem pretty cool. First, let's go over what the blue check mark is because this is the this is the basic check mark, right? This is what you and I can sign up for. Anybody can sign up for this one. We can sign up for a blue check mark. You just have to have your $8 or $11 and also a verified good account. So, 
blue check mark, according to Twitter, says may mean different things. Either that an account was verified under Twitter's previous verification criteria, which is active, notable, and authentic, or that the account has an active subscription to Twitter's new blue subscription product. It's available on iOS and on the web. Accounts that receive the blue check mark as part of the Twitter blue subscription will not undergo review to confirm that they meet the active, notable, and authentic criteria that was used in the previous process. So that kind of, it's sort of doublespeak. And this is from Twitter themselves because they said, hey, in their authentication process, they're going to have to authenticate all of these Twitter blue accounts, right? The new subscriptions. So, and this Twitter blue check mark, this is directly from the profile labels Twitter account on twitter.com. Okay, so the gold check mark. Now, this is the new one. This is the cool one. This is the bling check mark. Gold check mark indicates that the account is an official business account through Twitter Blue for Business. Pretty cool. And they go on to say the official labels, the official profile label is applied to government accounts, institutional accounts, elected or appointed officials, and multilateral organizations. Certain political organizations, such as political parties, commercial companies, including business partners, major brands, media outlets, and publishers, and some other public figures. And they identify some of the labels as state-affiliated media and government accounts that play a role as a geopolitical or official government communication channel display a unique label. Now, here we get into the state-affiliated media labels and the government labels. State-affiliated profiles provide additional context about accounts that are controlled by certain state-affiliated media entities and individuals closely associated with these entities. Government labels apply to accounts heavily engaged in geopolitics and diplomacy from main countries where Twitter operates. The labels also contain information about the country the account is affiliated with and whether it is operated by a government representative or a state-affiliated media entity. Additionally, a small icon or a flag is included to signal the account status as a government account or of a podium for state-affiliated media. And candidate labels, this is a little bit different. They contain additional information about Twitter accounts for official national-level political candidates for some elections. The label appears on the profile of the candidate's Twitter account and on the tweet sent and retweeted by the candidate's account. Labels contain information about the office the candidate is running for, the state the office is located in, and the district number. And now we have automated account levels. And now we have automated account labels for bots. When an account displays the automated account label, you know the account is generated automated content not produced by a human. And I want to put a little bit of perspective on this because before you had to be a notable person to have any sort of these labels. In order to have a blue check mark, you had to be a personality, you had to be on TV, or you had to have a popular podcast or a very popular YouTube channel or something like that. Now anybody can buy a check mark. You could buy the $8 or $11 check mark and you could be a person that's verified. Now it's not going to hold the same way that it used to. Now this shows that Twitter is headed in a new direction and the direction is that everybody that's verified on Twitter is a real person. And I think this is a bigger picture move by Elon and the Twitter staff to show that they have users that are actual people to advertisers for the future. And in the eyes of an advertiser, real people that are dedicated to the platform and that are active on the platform and use the platform are way more valuable to advertise to than somebody who's a bot or somebody that has an automated account. Also, it brings in a revenue stream for Twitter while they're setting up the new company. And in the future, Elon and Twitter will be setting up new revenue streams for the platform. One of them will be streaming video. And with the Twitter blue check mark, you'll be able to upload 1080p video. Now, this is not that great compared to something, say, like YouTube, which is a dedicated video platform where you can go up to 4K, 6K, And in the future, eventually, we'll get up to 8K video. But right now, Twitter is at 1080p video, which isn't too bad. Like Most people watch YouTube on 1080p, and that's fine. But I would assume Twitter would kind of bump it up a little bit if they want to compete with the other video platforms out there and attract video professionals from YouTube to start posting their videos on Twitter. Because some of them really enjoy uploading their videos in 4K. And the quality of the video really does matter 
if you're watching on a bigger screen compared to something like on your phone. But a 1080p video on your phone doesn't look that bad compared to a 4K even a 720p video on your phone, though you can tell it's different than a 1080p video, 720p video on your phone compared to, say, a 720p video on your TV is much different. The pixel density on a phone is much, much greater than on a TV. So a 1080p video looks much crisper on a phone than it does on a computer screen or even a tablet. So you could see why they only went with 1080p and also uploads of 1080p and most Twitter users on a mobile platform like a phone, like an iOS or on an Android device. That reduces the bandwidth that Twitter has to use and Twitter has to pay for bandwidth that they have coming into their platform, also going out of their platform. So if they restrict it to 1080p, they're not going to be spending the money generating 4K streamable content. And Twitter might not even have the hardware installed to generate 4K content on the platform. So this could be a cost-saving device. People are going to be spending the $8 to $11 on a subscription. That should offset the cost of them uploading video and also watching 1080p video on the platform. There will be other ways for Twitter to monetize the platform in the future, whether it's through video or audio. They're talking about bringing podcasting to Twitter. And of course, with podcasting and video, you have advertisements. And YouTube gives you a 70-30 split where the creator gets 70% of the ad revenue and the uh, platform gets 30% of the ad revenue. So if Twitter does something like that, Twitch does a 50-50 split, which isn't in favor of the creators. So a lot of creators are moving from Twitch to YouTube because they can see the money coming in. So if Twitter can work in those kind of boundaries between 70 and 65-ish, if they offer 80% to move your channel from YouTube to Twitter, I think some people would actually move over to Twitter. I think there would be some people, the revenue split was 80-20, creators getting 80% and the platform getting 20%. There's a possibility that some of the bigger names would move over to Twitter and maybe they're going to give them uh, a creator deal. You know, maybe they're going to sponsor them for the first year, give them X amount of dollars, $100,000 to post on the platform for a year so they can grow the user base. This would also bring in more advertising revenue because more people would be seeing videos for a longer amount of time. And that's why you see advertisers spending more on podcasting than they would on a YouTube video. YouTube videos are relatively inexpensive because if you have an eight minute video, you only have eight minutes to show people ads or for people to listen to your ad. Now, a podcast, on the other hand, if you have the audience's attention for, say, three hours for a nice long podcast, you have numerous times to advertise to them. And with any sort of platform, they're going to generate revenue because there will be more people listening and watching on the platform. So they can go after those high value advertisers like Apple and Microsoft and the automobile companies to give them the money to bring these people over and to post their podcasts and their video on Twitter, making them multiple millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in the process. And one of the cost cutting measures that Elon did, he, he gutted the company, literally physically gutted the corporate office. And now there's a surplus of assets from Twitter that are up for auction. Heritage Global Partners are auctioning off some of Twitter's internal things. There's a Twitter blue statue. Now let's see what this has. The opening bid is $25 USD. Overall dimensions, 46 inches wide, 41 inches tall, 12 inches deep. Okay. So that's not a bad deal. That's about four feet wide, about four feet tall. It's pretty big. It's a piece of history. They have some molded plywood lounge chairs that were there in the office that the workers used to build Twitter. There's other espresso machines as well. Large espresso machines professional espresso machines that will be going for thousands of dollars in these auctions, maybe tens of thousands of dollars. I'm not sure how much they cost. Coffee grinders, flywheel slicer. There's things that people used in the cafes in Twitter, full-size combi ovens. There's ovens for sale, electric ovens for sale. There's pizza ovens for sale, rotisseries for sale that they had at the Twitter headquarters. And this is sort of a it's an ongoing thing in tech because they want you to stay in the office. If you can have a good meal in the office, you're more than happy 
to go to the office cafeteria and then eat your meal, take care of your dishes, sit around and chit chat for a few minutes. It's all kind of a college campus. They set it up like college campuses because basically everyone that used to work at startups are pretty young. And now everyone's kind of getting into this mindset that this college campus thing, well, it's not the it's not all it's cracked up to be. But when Twitter was building out thousands of employees there, friends and family come through, people come through with meetings, you have to hobnob, you have to schmooze, you need great food for that, but also the workers that are there. You want them to produce as much content as possible, as much code as possible. You want them to be nearby because if anything needs to be done, they can just pick up their phone. They get a, an announcement and they say, okay, well, we can just put our dishes down. We can put our food down. We'll bring it back to our desk and then we'll get the work done. They don't really have to have to go away or stray away from anything Twitter related. And this is a, a crazy thing. They have a displays 55 inch Ergotron Neoflex VHD mobile media center displays. There's numerous of these things all throughout here. There's probably 20 of these things, 60 inch 60 inch LED TVs, tons of these things. And I'm sure these are going to be going up in the box. They're going to be going up for auction for thousands of dollars. Eventually there's an Ergotron WorkFit dual workstation in a box. There's all sorts of things on the Twitter auction block right now that you would never feel like it was the appropriate thing to have in an office. Normally you go to an office, you get your work done and it's great, right? You get, you do your thing. You get there. But in the Twitter offices, Google 55-inch Jamboard whiteboard display starts at $50 opening bid. It'll go for thousands of dollars. These things are expensive. And opening bids, bids open January 17th of 2023. I'm going to leave a link to this in the description. So please take a second and look through all of these yourself because there's a lot of tech here. I haven't really seen any computers. It's more things like office equipment. And also, you know, things like there's a kegerator for sale in a mixer, a planetary floor mixer with accessories. The thing is huge. It is, uh, let's see how big this thing is. A shipping is ship. HGP does not ship. Buyers are responsible for their own shipping arrangements. So you can't even get this thing shipped to you. It's a 40 quart capacity bowl, dough hook, pastry beater, wire whip. Six, it's in the sixth floor kitchen, sixth floors for Twitter, six floors for Twitter. And if you think about it, what do you do on Twitter? You tweet back and forth and there's a bunch of people that tweet back and forth. And then you kind of think, why do we need six floors? But the, the thing, the thing is massive. Twitter is a massive building and they have the, they've had the building for years. They built up the interior of this building and they're going to, they're going to be downsizing everything. And possibly Elon has hinted at this at a few occasions that there's a possibility that they're going to kind of have the offices at the bottom floors and then have living arrangements on the top floors. Elon said they're already putting in beds and new bathrooms and things like that. And the, uh, the code enforcers in San Francisco kind of got on their case about it, about the beds that they were installing in the Twitter headquarters. So eventually, I think what they're going to be doing is using the bottom floors for the office work. And then you can just live upstairs, live above the office. How easy is that? And you don't need all of these cafeterias. You don't need all this equipment. But also, you know what that means? That people that were making the food for these people, the people that were working hard behind the scenes to keep these people fed, to give them drinks, all those people are out of jobs. But if you had a job at Twitter for, you know, two, three, four years, it's going to be pretty easy to pick up another job. But a Twitter job was pretty cushy at this point. You know, I don't, and I know it's hard work. I'm a coder myself, so I understand how hard the work is when you're coding, but it is a kind of cushy environment. If you have a cafe or two or three or four and the food is delicious, I used to work at a startup and I, and I know the, the employees were treated very well. We had cafes, we had two cafes, two organic cafes and a, a latte machine and all sorts of fun things like that. Basketball, half a basketball court. We had actually three professional ping pong tables and an inside track all sorts of fun things that you could play around with, but also the food was there and we had a little cafeteria. It was a really cushy, fun job. And I don't think that's going to be happening anymore. I think there are going to be some places that are going to stick to that. Like Google has a really creative headquarters. Apple is very similar, but I don't think the idea of startup culture with ping pong tables 
and foosball and those kind of things are really going to catch on anymore. I think people want the real benefits, which are money and retirement plans and things like that. You know, like all the extra stuff. That's great. All the perks are great, but I don't know. I think it's going to, I think it's shifting. I really do. And I think Elon is right. He's ahead of everybody with this because he's moving all of this equipment and downsizing everything because he sees that, hey, this is work. You don't need to come here and play all the time. You don't need to come here and eat eat uh, gourmet meals at work every day at the office. So downsizing everybody, downsizing everything and just going to work seems like that's going to be the the paradigm shift for not only Twitter, but I think there are going to be some other tech companies that follow Twitter's lead as well. With all of this Twitter talk recently, some of Elon's other companies have been feeling the effects of the way that he's been portraying himself on Twitter. I reported that something like Twitter, if Elon kind of goes off the handle, goes a little bit wonky, starts tweeting like mad, starts saying things and letting people back in the platform, that somehow this could spill over into some of his other companies like Tesla, SpaceX, Boring Company, Neuralink. And on Monday, Elon was dethroned as the richest person in the world. The title is now held by LVMH chairman and CEO Bernard Arnault at the close of Monday, according to Forbes. And Tesla's shares are down too. They're about 6.3 to 6.7% down and have more than halved in value this year, partially due to a sell-off that accelerated in the week of uh, Musk's $44 billion Twitter acquisition. So Musk's wealth is mainly tied up in Tesla, and it was propelled by this rise in the stock price, which was about 1,000% up in two years. And Arnaud, he has holding vehicles and family trusts, and he owns a little over 60% of LVMH's voting share class, and our no is worth $186.2 billion. Musk, on the other hand, owns 14.11% of Tesla's shares with a market value of $530 billion. He also owns more than 40% of SpaceX shares, and that's billions to his net worth based on $125 billion private market valuation from June of this year. And in a down year for stocks, LVMH have dropped about 1.5% in 2022. So LVMH is based in Paris and is listed on the Euronext Paris Exchange. So there could be some slight bumps and a little bit of bruising going on for Elon, but this has happened to him before. He gets dethroned. He comes back. The valuation of Tesla goes down. It comes back up. And you will see when this wild ride is all over, if Elon is the most rich person in the world again. And also, I want to tell you about our Patreon. If you're enjoying this show, you can go to patreon.com slash stage zero to help us out. And when I say us, I mean me. I do these shows on my own. I edit the video. I edit the audio. I do everything on my own. I do all the research on my own. And I bring it to you because I think it's important to bring these topics to the world. You know, I'm an Elon Musk fan. I think he's done some really great things. He does some weird things too. Don't get me wrong, but I've been a fan. I actually moved to Texas for 10 months to cover SpaceX Starship from the side of a dusty road at about 110 degrees every day. I was filming. I was shooting photos. I was live streaming because I believe in that mission so much. So please, if you believe in my mission here to bring Elon news and SpaceX news and Tesla news, investor news to the masses, please take a second and hit the subscribe button on your podcast platform. That's the easiest way for you to help me out. And also, if you can go to Patreon, patreon.com slash stage zero, I'll leave a link in the description. That's the best way for you to help me out because it really does help to, you know, get the show out there more. And also to have, you know, maybe bump up the production levels a little bit. I like doing the show, but I would like to, I'd like to upgrade it a little bit. And it's, you know, your support would be very helpful with that. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks for all your support throughout this whole process. It's really cool to be part of this. I'll see you next time and take care of yourself and each other.